Patrick Rawson, and we basically, oh, I don't know, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, we were on our networking Zoom call that we do on Mondays, and we were talking about investments. And we had talked about the rule of 72 and, and all of these different things. And we were saying, well, how do you, for many of us in our groups, people that are uh, maybe a little bit older, we don't have enough time on our side to try and invest and wait for all of that returning compounding interest. So we said, well, what can we get into that could basically generate us income? So we started talking about it. And we started to come up with different ideas. And so we started to grow a foundation of, of I don't know, probably about a dozen people. And we are going to be launching this concept on a monthly basis where we are going to showcase different ways and ideas on how to grow your wealth. We're not pitching you. We're basically going to show you ideas. You can take them and leave them. We want you to do your own due diligence and look into them, whatever that may be. So the founders of this group, Rudy, Luke, myself, and two gentlemen that are not here, which is Horesh Surti and Richard Layton. Uh, the intention here, like I said, we are going to bring one of them and another idea that we're going to put on, uh, on the platform for you to hear about. And it'll usually be in a networking, learn, eat, meet, greet. That's what we're going to try and do. And nothing better than right here at Hawaii Food Art because this is one of the franchises that Rudy was behind with Elva and Luke. It's all about networking and connections. So having said that, Rudy, you want to introduce what we have here sure. and take it on over. <clears throat> You haven't heard me speak yet, so I'm <laughs> lost and premature. Uh, yeah, let's start the chant, start the chant. We do that at every chamber meeting. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to, you know, we're kicking off this series on seven streams of income. Uh, I'm going to, I've got kind of an introduction built into what I'm going to do, so I'm going to circle back into that uh, here in just a little bit. But we're going to just kind of dive right in. I'll start with giving just a little background information on myself uh, so you know where I'm coming from. I've been in the franchise world 32 years now, um, up to over 800 businesses open in that in that period of time. Don't know of any that closed because it just didn't work. We had a couple that were close, but we worked real hard to fix it, save it, or find a buyer or do whatever needed to be done, but we had great luck uh, doing that for folks. Uh, I get around, I, I've traveled all 50 states, I've done most of that in my franchise travel. I've also been to all 24 time zones around the globe. So um, I like to tell everybody I, I've met people who have done each of those things, but I've never met anybody else who's done both of those things. So uh, I've owned two franchises of my own. I'm a single dad. My daughter Lexi just graduated college. Uh, you now she's doing her thing and I'm doing my thing. So uh, that's really all there is about me. Uh, I'm going to start with this. Robert Kiyosaki, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, and uh, creator of the cash flow quadrant. And he tells folks that there are three ways of generating income. There's earned income, there's portfolio income, and then passive income. And we're gonna expand on that just a little bit with some of these other ideas that we have here in the seven streams of income. Earned income is obviously going to work every day, collecting your paycheck. Portfolio, you have an investor uh, or an investment person like Luke who can help guide you down the path of investing in the stock market, bond markets, other commodities, all, all kinds of things that are out there that he could certainly speak to. And then there's passive income. Where can you put your money that just sends you money on the side? All right? So we're going to talk about some of those ideas. But some of that has uh, sprung up here from, from Robert Kiyosaki's ideas. So we're going to talk about seven streams of income. Now, the idea of seven streams of income starts with the idea or a fact a uh, survey done of millionaires in the United States recently that they average seven streams of income. Each of them 
So they don't just go to work every day and become millionaires, right? They have other ways of generating income that the sum of those parts, right, allows them to truly build wealth. And that's what that's all about. On average, they have seven different areas of income, whether that's multiple businesses or investment types or whatever, that's where that comes from. So that's really been the, the genesis of what we're talking about here in this uh, talk series is, is how to find some of those other ways of generating income. So some of those, you go to work every day, right? you just have your job, you find, you take some of that money that you earn, you go to talk to Luke and you invest it in the market somehow, some way. He helps you with that strategy, right? There are real estate plays. Everybody says, oh, if I had some money, I'd invest in real estate. I'll buy a house, I'll buy rental properties, I'll make money, I can build wealth. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely uh, one of the methods. Uh, cryptocurrency, Richard Wagler, who's part of our founding group, that's his area of expertise. He'll talk about uh, cryptocurrencies and how those things work. And, and you can dabble in some of that um, on your own. Then there's, you know, there's kind of that traditional side hustle. What can I do on the side that makes me a little extra money? Whether that's a, a multi-level marketing opportunity or I just have a hobby. Like I like to do woodworking and I make picnic tables and I sell them out of my garage. That could be, you know, that could be qualified as a, a, a other stream of income. Uh, you can group projects and make a business investment and that could be in real estate or it could be in investing or it could even be in franchising. You could get a group of people together who don't have a ton of money each, but the sum of all of that could be something that works. And, and Paresh would speak to that one when we get to hear from him in our talk series about how we gather a group of investors that put together a little bit of money each, the sum of which gives us enough to be an uh, investment segment to his projects, which is buying hotels. Um, I could never do that by myself, but as a group, we can certainly find a way to do that. Um, so those are different ways that this streams of it, and, and there are more than just what's here on the list, but this is just kind of expanding your mind on what we're talking about in our series here on seven streams of income. Today, we're gonna to add franchising to that list, because that's my background. Like I said, I've been in the franchise world 32 years. Uh, my, my purpose today is just to talk a little bit about franchising, explain how it works, give you a little background, and uh, we'll go from there. So first we're gonna start with what is franchising? In my opinion, and I hear a lot of people say, I'm in the franchise industry. People in, who do what I do say they're in the franchise industry. Franchising is not an industry. Franchising is a way for companies to expand their footprint. So it's a strategy for growth in various industries. Restaurants are an industry they expand through franchising. Automotive businesses, sign businesses, whatever it is, those are the individual industries, but franchising is the strategy behind taking that to market and expanding the footprint across a geographic area, whether that's regional, national, or even global. Uh, Ray Kroc started with one McDonald's hamburger stand in San Diego 60, 65 years ago. There are now 45,000 restaurants around the world. That's the power of franchising. That's, that's, and they are the, defined by most of us in the franchise world as the Cadillac of things. You want to do it the right way, Follow what McDonald's did, right? Put your, put your hamburgers together the same way and, and, and replicate the model. So that's really what that's all about. Uh, it also comes with a definition. The Federal Trade Commission regulates franchising. And so if a company collects a fee from an individual who's going to build a like model business, and out of that like model business is going to pay a percentage of that revenue, a royalty, then that is defined by the Federal Trade Commission as a franchise. Okay? There are other ways that a company can expand its footprint. There are distributorships, there are licensee models, there are uh, wholesale retail you know, components and partnerships and things like that. Those are different than the traditional franchise model because again, if, if you are expanding your footprint and you collect a fee up front and you're collecting a percentage of that revenue, you are then defined by the Federal Trade Commission as a franchise and have to follow a certain set of rules, disclosure rules and registrations and so forth that, uh, that are required in that, in that particular business. I'll talk about some of that here in a, in a little bit. It's also a relationship. And I use the word relationship as opposed to partnership. Partnership infers kind of shared money, okay? So 
This is a franchise, Hawaii Fluid Art, owned by an owner operator who had to put up all the money herself to build this. Okay? She didn't have shared money with the founders of Hawaii Fluid Art, who office down in Dallas. Okay? That would be a partnership if you shared investment in it. She made the investment. So she has a relationship with that home office. She paid that upfront fee to be for the rights to sign that contract. She got trained by that home office to learn how to do all this, how to design a store, how to do paintings, how to, the whole model comes as part of that. And then a percentage of her revenue goes back to that home office or company each month to uh, in, in royalties. And so it, it fits the definition under the, the Federal Trade Commission rules of what a, of what a franchise is. Okay? It's also a licensing agreement. So when, when someone signs for a franchise, they sign a pretty hefty contract, right? How many, how many pay, 40, 50 pages, all, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and you get to review all that and, and certainly should have it reviewed by counsel when, when you get that. But a couple of things that I wanna talk about. Um, a lot of folks will look at that licensing agreement and go, you know what? It looks like the home office, the franchisor, has all the power in this relationship. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that, right? And the truth is, they are written that way on purpose. And I'll give you an example as to why. Kimberly comes in and buys a McDonald's, puts up her golden arches, starts making hamburgers. She's happy. Lou comes in, spends $100,000 on that contract, builds a McDonald's, puts up the golden arches, starts making hamburgers. Kylie comes in, she's a rogue. Her favorite color is purple. She spends $100,000, signs a contract, puts up a hamburger stand, and puts up purple arches. What does Luke have to say about that? What does Kimberly have to say about that? What do the 45,000 other people around the world have to say about her purple arches? Don't like it. It tarnishes the brand. It confuses the customer. We don't like it. McDonald's then has to have a strong enough agreement to make her change that sign. That's why they're one side. They have to have enough control to manage the brand in the processes to meet the customer's expectations. At the end of the day, that's what that's all about. And so those contracts are written that way. So when you review a franchise agreement, you say, well, it's a little one-sided, but as long as I'm gonna follow this program and I like what they do, it shouldn't be an issue. If I'm gonna be a rebel and start putting up different colors, maybe franchising isn't for you. Maybe you should just go put up McDowell's and put up purple arches. Right? Everybody saw that movie, right? <laughs> and, uh, and and do your own thing, right? Because if that's how your thinking is, some people are too entrepreneurial for franchising. So that's that can be the case. You just go open your own, own hamburger stand and do it however you want. Okay. Um, you'll see in McDonald's there's, there's lots of unique things if you pay attention or are aware of them. Uh, the fry machine is always where by the by the drive-through window, right? In the first store, it wasn't. They found that that doesn't work. When people are coming through the drive-thru, we need to be able to pick up the hamburger, get the fries, and go to the window. The store flows that way, so they design stores for a reason. Elvis' store here is designed the way it's designed for a reason. It's a proven concept. She just follows the model, right? She's coachable, and she follows the model, and we expect she'll be successful like the other stores because it's a, it's a proven concept. Um, there's, a, there's also, most people don't notice that there's a clock above the drive-thru window if you're inside the restaurant. And you look and you see there's, there's a clock ticking down. So every order that comes through. So if you've ever been in the drive-thru and they say, would you please pull over to space number one? We'll be out in just a minute. If they can't give you your order before that clock gets to zero, they send you to park somewhere else so they can keep the line moving. That's part of the system that McDonald's teaches to have an efficiently run restaurant. Right? So that's what the franchise, the, the, that part of the value of bringing it into the, into the system. So that licensing agreement you're going to sign is... Uh, Generally, either a five or 10 year agreement. If you're doing a larger restaurant concept, sometimes they're 20 in order to give you time to get your investment back and make some money because uh, they take a little longer to spin up. But uh, generally a five or 10 year deal, they're usually renewable as long as you've done what you're supposed to do, you're still compliant. You may have to sign the then current franchise agreement 10 years from now. So if the royalty structure changes or some of the design changes, you may have to change, you know, put up a a blue wall here and make that one white or whatever. There may be some redesign options. I'm making that stuff up. You never, never know what comes out 10 years from now. Um, but you have to go to the then current standards 
uh, of the franchise agreement. You can also opt out. You can shut it down and walk away. You can sell the business. You have, you have options, but the franchisor is primarily in control because you have an expectation as a consumer of what I'm going to find when I walk into this Hawaii Fluid Art or this Meineke or this McDonald's. That's what you look for. There's also a franchise disclosure agreement that comes with it. The Federal Trade Commission has mandated what that looks like. That document has 23 sections. Every company that franchises, all 4,000 of them that are registered to sell franchises in the United States today, all format this document the same way. So if you're comparing Hawaii Fluid Art to a mining key, or trying to make a decision as a consumer which brand to buy, you can find the information you're looking for to compare because they're in the same section. Right, section seven always has the startup cost. It's going to cost you this to open this business, this to open this business, and this to open this business. It's in the same section every time. That way you can find it. Earnings representations are always in section 19. A list of all the other owners in the system to call for reference, section 20. Right, they're all formatted the same so that you can find the information you're looking for as a consumer. It's really a consumer protection document. Right? That's, that's really what they're looking for. <laughs> Take that a step further, there are 14 states in the United States that also have required registration to sell franchises in that state. You have to be approved, so you reviewed and approved by the state in order to sell a franchise to a consumer in that state. Hawaii, California, Washington, the Dakotas, Indiana, Illinois, Virginia, Maryland, New York, Michigan, Wisconsin, and so uh, I've known this a long time. I should know that. Um, so, in those states, you also have to register. Some companies don't register in all those states until they get more established in the business so that they can have the financials and all the other things necessary to be approved in that state. Otherwise, those states will either deny you the right to sell franchises or uh, they may require that you escrow certain amounts of funds and tie up your money to sell the franchise until that store performs before you can actually collect your. And so, forth. so it becomes a, a, a little bit of a headache. There's also 13 additional states that have filing requirements. Texas is one of those where if you're going to sell franchises here, you have to tell the attorney general that I'm selling franchises in Texas, $25, here you go. And if there's a complaint, they pull your documents out of the file cabinet and they know who to call. Other than that, they don't care. The remaining 26 states, wide open, do whatever you want. Uh, once you're registered with the Federal Trade Commission, then you're good to go. In that uh, disclosure agreement, that's generally the document you want to have reviewed by an attorney. Uh, have someone make sure that, you know, if, if they can't make any changes to the agreement, you at least know what you're signing. And so I always uh, recommend folks get counsel to review documents. Uh, the disclosure document will also include things like, uh, is the company involved in any litigation? Is that litigation franchise owner suing the parent company for non-performance for some reason? Those would be things you want to know. They are required by law to disclose them. So if anything's going on there that you need to know about, it's in that line. Uh, the earnings claims. Um, they'll give you a financial representation of how the business performs, but they may also put them in such a way that makes them look the best. And so you may want to make sure you dive into those numbers and understand what they're telling you, because they're always going to use that document to paint the best picture. No pun intended. Uh, so they're going to want to they're going to make all those representations in a way that makes them look the most enticing as a franchise to buy. But it's okay to ask questions and dive into those numbers and find out what's going on. So types of franchises, the way to be involved in a franchise. The first is as an owner-operator. Uh, that means basically you're stepping out of your corporate job and you're going to be doing this day in and day out. Right? You're, going to, you're going to be a day-to-day -day operator. Uh, Maya's here every day, open to close. She's got a little bit of help. She'll get more help as she gets busier. Uh, but she's an owner-operator. She fits that definition of what that's all about. You also have options to be semi-absentee or a complete absentee owner. There are brands that encourage that or allow for that, and some that prefer that. A lot of the fitness concepts would rather not have Bernie there, not because he's not a nice guy or he would be nice to the customers, but they want a 24-year-old fit bodybuilder person conducting classes right, who fits the model enticing people to join and become members, right? That person is going to run your, your little boutique gym, right? And you just step in on Sundays and pick up the deposit bag and pay for the bank. 
That's all, that's all they really require. So that, that could be uh, uh, an example of a semi-absentee. Um, I've got a, a brand where if you buy the equipment, the franchise or will run the company for you. Uh, we've got a pet grooming franchise, we've got a CBD store where the franchise will run the whole business for you and just send you a check every month. Complete absentee ownership. So those are options in the franchise world that a lot of people don't know. They think, oh, I gotta quit my job and do this. Not necessarily. You could even get, we talked at the beginning about having groups, investment groups. You could have an investment group buy one of these semi-absentee model businesses. Again, nobody has to be there. Right? The franchise will run it for you and you just review the financials and make sure it's performing to your expectations. The other thing that multi-unit for the uh, types of businesses, types of franchise that folks can get into is either the multi-unit and or the multi-brand. You don't have to just buy one. Uh, one of the most successful stories that I'm familiar with, a gentleman out of uh, Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, he scraped together some money and built his first Burger King in 1971. Today, him and his family have over 500 restaurants across seven different brands in their portfolio. He sold his 41 Pizza Huts and 55 Burger Kings about four years ago and bought into Pi 5 and other more new, refreshed concepts to expand his, his footprint. But he started with one in a single brand. He expanded in that brand, he became a multi-unit owner with Burger King. And then when he was built out of his area, he didn't have any more room for more Burger Kings, he tried other brands. And as long as he's not in another burger brand, he can do that. So he's got a pizza brand, he's got a chicken wing brand, he's got a smoothie chain. In all, he's got over 500 food service concepts in his portfolio today. And so those are, that, that's how you, you do some of those kinds of things. Um, the biggest franchisee that I know of is a gentleman named Pierre, Guillermo Corrales. He's from Mexico, and he's got 1,400 restaurants. Uh, Golden Corrales, Burger Kings, Popeyes. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Popeyes and, and uh, Burger King on El Dorado. <coughs> and that's one of his. The Golden Corral down uh, by the Walmart off of 121. That's one of his as well. I got to know him when I was working at the Renaissance Center. He was trying to buy some franchises from us. And we got to know about him and what his, his portfolio looked like back, uh, back in the day. But it starts with the first one. Everybody starts with the one. He came to America from Mexico and he started with one and was able to acquire more, and build, and build, and build. Elba has that same opportunity in front of her. This is her first, has aspirations of more, certainly has the capacity to do more. Uh, we have the marketplace here in this area to do it. But she could also have one out of state, hire some staff to run it, and just travel between the two. She's got family in another part of the country or whatever, wherever she might want to be. Those are opportunities that will, will come up once this store gets up and running. Uh, biggest misconceptions in franchising. A lot of people think it's all fast food, right? That's the first thing people think about. Uh, I don't have the money. How am I going to pay for all this? And franchising is too complicated. I don't, I'll just go do it myself. I'll just figure out what else I'm going to do or I'll just continue to go to work every day. So, you guys are familiar with most of these brands, all fast food brands, right? That's what a lot of people think about is, is what franchising is all about. But I'm going to tell you it's not just all fast food. Here's some companies you've probably heard of. Ponderosa, Meineke, Mathnesium, Budget Lines, Fast Signs, all franchise concepts, all brand names you've heard of, but may not have known that they were franchises. Right? And so those are brands that my company represents and we can help people connect to. We also have Triple M Mobility, Papaleco, Costa Oil, Petopia, Hawaii Fluid Art, brands that you may not even know existed that are also franchised. These are the emerging brands, the up and coming <coughs> brands that people are talking about that create business opportunities in the marketplace today. And so uh, those are some great ways and all of them have uh, financial representations and can tell you exactly what they do. This color only down here at the bottom. Um, is a, uh, a concept that Fran Drescher from the Nanny, if you remember that TV show, 
her cousin who used to do her hair when she was on in Hollywood and on Broadway now has a concept because he's a hair guy. That's what he does. And so he's figured out a way to streamline the process of getting your hair colored in 30 minutes. Ladies love it. When we went to their grand opening, we watched them do 45 customers in four hours. It was a factory, right? It was just a production line. Great business model. It's going to be a hot, hot brand coming soon. I don't have the money. Well, none of us have the money in our checking account to build a franchise. But there are lots of ways to leverage funds, right? So we talked about how you get money to do these things. You can uh, leverage home equity, right? Housing market went up. Lots of people have equity in their house now that they can tap into. They can use a little piece of that and, and then partner that with SBA financing. Uh, there's portfolio lending. So if you have an account with an investment guy, you can pledge that without taking the money out of uh, your investment accounts, but just pledge that as leverage to be able to uh, pay for building the franchise. Uh, the ROPS program uh, came out of the uh, CARES Act. It allows people to use retirement money without penalty or taxation to be able to fund investing in the franchise. Right? I typically don't advise people to use their entire retirement plan to do that, but if you want to take a piece of it and partner that with an SBA loan, you can certainly find the fund funding to be able to build something like Kauai Food Art. There's also private money, family members, investors, partnerships, some of the things that we've been talking about. Those are ways to be able to build that franchise. I can do it myself, probably not a good idea. 80% of all new businesses are closed in 24 months. Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that. I'm not just making that up. Franchising flips that. 80% of all franchises that open are open after 24 months, which means they're on their way to being successful in, in some fashion. Um, I've never closed one. Opened up over 800 of them so far. Call it lucky, knock on wood, but um, we try to keep it that way. Um, why franchise? Because it covers your cost of learning. You'll probably spend more figuring out whatever it is you're trying to do than it would be if you just bought the franchise and followed their system. And if you're coachable to it, follow the process, uh, that'll accelerate the, the, the learning curve. Uh, it's a, franchising is about following a proven system the operation system, the marketing system, following the support, just be coachable. That's what Maya has done. She went, she learned how to do it. She's just replicating the process. At McDonald's, two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, on a sesame seed bun every time. You're probably going to do just fine. As long as you put the fry machine by the drive. Uh, why a franchise consultant? Uh, we help people find the right franchise, uh, find sources of funding, Get legal representation, provide insights that you probably didn't even know to ask when you're when you're talking about looking at franchise. Is it a good fit for you? I think that speaks to why I've been more successful putting people in the right business, right? Finding this for Elva as opposed to an oil change place was the right fit. I have no doubt this is the right fit for her. It may not be the right fit for Bernie. He may need to do something different. He may like oil change. He may want you know, but it's about that process. Uh, in addition, we help uh, companies become franchises. So I'm working with clients uh, here in the, in the marketplace who have a business that want to become a franchise but have no idea how to do that. We also provide that service. So there are services there to help people get your disclosures filed, build your marketing systems, all the things necessary to become a franchise. That wraps up what I had to present, kind of educate folks on the franchise process. Uh, Elvo is uh, the first Hawaii Fluid Arts franchise to sign an agreement. They became a franchise. They actually came to my company uh, about a year and a half ago and said, we want to be a franchise. So my company helped them do that, which was the last slide that I showed you, that process to become a franchise. We introduced it to our broker network, which was the same time that they introduced me to Elvis and we're looking for something to do. I said, I got, I got the perfect fit for you. And we made that introduction. She fell in love with it, and here we are today. Of an entrepreneurial dreams come true. That's what we do. So, um, if anybody's got any questions, be happy to take them. Otherwise, I appreciate you guys coming out and learning a little bit about franchising and continue to stick with us in this series of seven streams of income because we'll show you lots of good stuff. Uh, in the meantime, help us finish off the one. Let's get Rudy a hand.